I started uh, there with K-State, talking with the Kansas Wheat Commission, they mentioned that, well, we have this yield contest going on for a few years. So I was really, really interested trying to learn what are they doing and what are their yields and what, what has been working, what management practices are more related to yield uh, than, than some of the other managements perhaps that uh, are not really showing up when we try to understand um, factors affecting with yield there. So just to give you a brief background here, right? whenever we're talking about yield, we have a few different levels. Yield potential, it's as much as you can get in that environment. Irrigation, best management practice, and so on. Now, whenever we're talking about dry land environments, we're talking about uh, our water limited yield. So it's gonna be slightly lower than our yield potential because it's limited by rainfall, distribution and rainfall amount. Now, these farmers that we're working with, they're gonna be somewhere in between that yield that is limited by water and the maximum economical yield. So they're probably not going to be economical, at least uh, adopting all of their management practices, probably not gonna be economical. So they're gonna be somewhere in between there. Typically, we say that our maximum economical yield is about 75% of our maximum yield for most systems. It ranges 70 to 80%. But typically, 75% of our maximum yield is typically economical there. And then we have our average farmer yield, right? This is the average of the county, average of the state, and so it takes into account a lot more variability there. It's typically what we call yield gap. That's uh, how much we can increase yields at a state level so we can get economically to the maximum that we can produce. So if we look at the Southern Great Plains, how does the current farmer yield looks like over the years here? There it is. So we have a year in the, in, in the bottom here and our grain yield uh, in the y-axis there. And we see that there was a pretty steep increase in grain yields in the 60s and 80s, uh, semi-dwarf varieties, advent of nitrogen fertilizer. But really since then, it's been kind of stable, right? From 1980s forward, our average yield has been kind of stable. So the question that we had here as well is, can we increase this yield or can we reduce the difference between our farmers and where they should be economically, uh, although we're really seeing no increases in yield gain or very limited increases in year over time. That trend in yield, if you look for Oklahoma only, it's even more stable. If we, if we look at these here, we can still, uh, for the Southern Plains, still see a little bit of an increase but for Oklahoma only, it's even more stable. So I went ahead and take, took a look at what our folks uh, in, in Australia are showing. And they're showing a very similar yield trend. So they don't have much of a yield gain in recent years uh, in Australia. But when they look at their yield potential, it has been going down because of uh, weather, uh, because of typical weather patterns in Australia, the yield potential is going down so when they're actually maintaining their yield, they're reducing that gap between where they could be and uh, where they actually are. So although there is a, a yield level have been uh, stable in Australia, they're reducing that yield gap. So here in this, this presentation, really what I wanna show is, first, let's take a look at these farmers that are in the wheat yield contest. What are they doing? And what management practices have been related or associated with yields among all those fields. And then, perhaps ground truth in some of these results from the farmer fields with research data. So this is what it looks like. If we look at, uh, if we look at this map here, we have wheat area in green. You have all these yellow points. They are fields that were entered in the Kansas wheat yield contest uh, over the last uh, seven years. So these were harvest years 2010 through 2017. It's a total of 100 fields, right? 100 fields entered during this, this period. And these are actually pretty high yielding fields. If we take a look at the average year, or, or here's what we have is the harvest year, the number of fields that were entered in the contest, what's the average of all those fields, minimum and maximum values, and how this compares to state level. So as you can see, the average ranges there anywhere from about 67 bushels per acre all the way through close to 99 on average bushels per acre. So very, very high yielding fields, especially as compared to 
our state level that ranges here from uh, about 28 all the way to about 57 there. And our maximum use that were reported as high as about 124 bushels per acre. So you see farmers getting 124 bushels per acre there when the state average was 48. So that's why we're wanting to look at these farmers, right? What are they doing differently? And so let me explain what we're looking at here because there will be a few graphs like these. We're pretty much looking at the distribution of those yields. All those 100 fields, what's the distribution of them? So here's the number of times and here's the yield level. So you see that our average yield in the entire 100 data set here was 82 bushels per acre, but it ranges from 32 all the way to 124. So the bulk of them are actually here in the center in between 70 and 90 bushels per acre. That's the, the yield levels that we're working with. If we look at the distribution of their management practices, how do the, this distribution look like? Because each one of these fields, they reported, what you're seeing there on the screen, they reported several different management practices. What they adopted as far as seeding rate, uh, tillage practices, uh, fungicide, insecticide, herbicide, and so on. So let's take a look at some of these management practices here and what were the adoption in these very high yielding fields that we're working with. So this is seeding rate, and this is in pounds of seed per acre. What you can see here is on average 78 pounds per acre and going from as low as 29 pounds per acre to as high as about 200 here. Now these two fields here that were planted at 200, they were actually planted pretty late. Right? They were planted after a soybean crop and they were planted really late, way beyond when they should be planting. But still, they are here in the yield contest, they, they yielded pretty well. So when planting late, these very high seeding rates are actually a good thing. But we're going to get in more details on, on the effect of seeding rate on, on wheat yields here in a little bit. If we look at this very same data here, but now looking at seeds per acre, right? Instead of pounds per acre, we can see that on average it was a bit, little bit shorter than 1.2 million seeds per acre. And again, those farmers who were on the very low end, they're less than 400,000 seeds per acre. And here we're, they're close to the 3 million seeds per acre. So a very wide range in seeding rate there at an average of about 1.1 million seeds per acre. Some more management practices that we can take a look at. So this is the total nitrogen applied in the growing season. So this includes pre-plant nitrogen and in-season nitrogen as well. Does not include any residual soil nitrate in the soil. So you can see that applied was on average 83 pounds of actual N per acre, uh, ranging from zero all the way until 220 or more. And what was interesting is when I was taking a look at if there was any relationship of how much nitrogen the farmers put out and yield, there was really nothing. No relationship there. And maybe Dr. Zen can, can go a little bit more detail on these, but uh, what we're seeing is really an effect of that residual soil nitrate, right? So probably some of these fields, actually, they might have 80 or 100 or even more uh, pounds of nitrogen in the profile. And so when we try to see if there is any type of relationship between a nitrogen applied and yield, we didn't find anything here because of that initial soil nitrate. But we didn't have that information, so I can't show that to you here. Units of phosphorus as well. We can see that several, about 25%, didn't use any phosphorus. And, but overall, on average, the average was 23 units uh, phos all the way until 50 or even more than 55 there. Uh, potassium, most of the growers didn't use any potassium, but there were a few uh, that, that did use anywhere until 20 or even more units of potassium. Uh, and sulfur, so we're seeing more and more some of these producers going out with some sulfur. Now, on average here, about seven pounds sulfur per acre. The, the wheat crop doesn't really need a lot of sulfur. If we're looking at an 80 bushel crop, probably what the crop is taking up in the grain is very close to the seven or eight units of sulfur. Now it needs another, probably another 15 or so in the straw, right? But it, what it's actually gonna take up is very close to this, uh, to this seven or so. So really it doesn't use a lot of sulfur, but we're seeing more and more sulfur deficiency, especially in, in South Central Kansas. So I'm assuming you guys would see some 
sulfur deficiency in north central Oklahoma as well. Now, this is some of the distribution of the data. Now, if we go ahead and look, okay, what's related to yield here in this data? We have all this management, what has related with yield. And in red here, we have some things that were negative, and this is a simple correlation, so they were negative related to yield, and in blue, some they're, they're positive, making our life a little bit easier there. Some of the things that were negative related with yield and positive related with yield as well. So positive there, we had infurophosphorus, we had seed treatment, uh, presence of insecticide, variety maturity, harvest year, and, and so on. Negative, we had seeding rate. Uh, we also had tillage, meaning that no till fields were actually yielding slightly more than, than conventional till, and so on. So let's go a little bit more detail and try to compare how, uh, how are these management practices affecting our, our yields. And to do that, we come back to our entire group of fields. And what we're going to do, we're going to compare the farmers that are in the low yielding range with farmers that are in the high yielding range. So pretty much we're going to do this comparison. Low yielding farmers, we had about 30, 33, and high yielding fields here as well. What do they differ as far as management goes? What are these farmers adopting that these farmers are not? So to give you an idea of the yield, the, our low yielding group, they were actually averaging close to 60 bushels per acre, 30 fields, and there was a difference, 35 bushels between the low yielding group and our high yielding group, yielding close to 90, 95. Right? So we have that very split difference between high yielding fields and low yielding fields. Now let's go into the management and see what difference among their management. First thing that we look at here, no till adoption. So we saw that Farmers in the high yielding group were more often adopting no-till than farmers in the high yielding group. Now, this doesn't mean that no-till is increasing yields. It just means that those farmers are more often adopting no-tillage practice. If you look at seeding rate, we can see that seeding rates on the high yielding group were actually slightly lower than seeding rates on the low yielding group. So there was a pretty clear difference there, about 200,000 seeds per acre less in the high yielding group. Now going a little bit more in depth into the seeding rate, right, if we open up here what was the average adoption seeding rate on, in each year in these fields, and we see that we have fields as low as less than 400,000 seeds per acre and close to 3 million seeds per acre as well, how does this uh, relate to grain yield? So this is a graph that we, when we plot seeding rate against, against grain yield, that's the, the graph that we have. Now, what I want to call your attention here is if we look at the average yield, so here between, I mean, less than 80 bushels per acre here, there's virtually, I mean, there's really no, no effect there. If you, plot, if you put a line there, it's going to be flat, pretty much no effect at your average yielding conditions here, pretty much no effect. Now, within these fields that we're looking at, it seems that if we're just looking at that maximum yield, as far as we can push, it seems that we didn't really have much effect from going with a very low population all the way until this close to 1.2 here, 1.1 actually. And then we're putting a cap in our potential. Again, if we're looking at average yield, 60 to 80 is here, there's no effect. But if we're pushing higher, it seems that like we're with those higher populations put in a cap. And that, that got me pretty curious there and started thinking what can be going on. So I have two books here. They, they, these books, they have pretty much everything that we have published, or well, not everything, but a lot of publications about wheat for K from K-State and from OSU as well. So what I want to ask you is, what do you think can be happening here why could we be putting this cap at high populations in our potential? And if you get it right, you get a book. So what do you think? Kyle, could you help me and get one of those books, please? Thank you. Too many feelers. That definitely can be one of the, expl one of the explanations, right? So that's an excellent point, and, and, and I'll have to be honest. Those two fields that were planted very late, 
uh, they are not here because they will be way beyond there. They are, they are at the tree, more or less. But they didn't agree with this curve here because they were planted late. These were all planted within the optimum. So too many tillers, we can use too much water early in the season. Remember, these are not grazed systems, right? Using too much water early in the season there. And so it can happen what we call haying off, right? They just use too much of that water early on. So thanks, you got one of the books there. Thanks, Kyle. And we're gonna get the next one here in a second. Another thing is that, that could be going on there as well, that because of that too many tillers, thank you. Uh, it would be a little bit more lodging, perhaps more disease pressure as well. Just too much canopy there. Now, the other book goes for whoever tells me what's going on in the other end. Why are we not seeing a new decrease going as low as 400,000 seeds per acre? That's like half of K-State's recommendation. That's like less than, than 20, less than 30 pounds per acre. Variety, so higher tillering variety. Variety, more vigor. Perhaps that could be one thing. What else? If we, if we have very low population, what do we need? Low rainfall areas? More tillers. Yeah, so we need more tillers. And to make sure that we have those tillers, what do we increase? Sunlight, but what can we manage that we increase? Fertility. Yep, you got it. Thanks. So these fields here, Actually, with the very low seeding rates, they total in the season, thanks Kyle, total in the season between soil profile, there you go, thank you, between soil profile and what the farmers applied, they got over 250 units of nitrogen in the season, very high phosphorus as well. Now, they didn't apply phosphorus, these were fields that have history of manure, so they already had some very low, very high levels of both nitrogen and phosphorus. So making sure that we have the fertility to, so those tillers not only are farmed, but they're sustained there as well. And this is one of the figures from this uh, very low seeding rate field. 120 bushels per acre, but you can see that uh, the amount of heads that we have out there, really each one of those plants were producing 12, 14 tillers or heads per plant. Okay, so let's uh, Let's move forward. Phosphate fertilizer, so in furrow phos here, a little bit higher as well in high yielding fields compared to low yielding. Uh, also, if we look at fungicide applied at the flag leaf, slightly higher adoption of fungicide in the higher yielding fields as well. Now, one thing that, uh, as you know, with fungicide we need to look at is variety resistance to either leaf or stripe rust. So when we break this down into the different variety resistances here, we have leaf rust, varieties that are resistant, and varieties that are susceptible. And our grain yield here, no fungicide in blue, with fungicide in yellow. So for resistant varieties, really no significant yield gain. For susceptible varieties, among these fields, close to 20 bushel per acre yield gain in susceptible varieties to leaf rust. Very similar to stripe rust here, no significant yield gain in resistant varieties and about 12 bushels per acre in the, in the susceptible varieties. It's very important this interaction of variety with, uh, with fungicide here as well. As far as previous crop, seems like if we're going after wheat or after soybeans, those fields were yielding a little bit less than if we're going after canola. And there's some field research here from Oklahoma kind of supporting that as well. And I guess finally here, if we look at nitrogen timing, uh, if we're putting all the nitrogen in the fall, we're yielding slightly less than putting all the nitrogen, or than putting at least 60% of the nitrogen in the spring. So a little bit of nitrogen timing here. Now, I'm gonna uh, stop here for a little bit and just let you think. Historic, typically, how do we do our, our field research? We go out in the field, we put our plots, we put our treatments, and then we measure yield. And that's very good because it lets us tell for sure what is causing what, right? What we're doing here is getting a pretty messy data set and trying to make sense of it, which is excellent, we can learn as well. But 
it would be equivalent to, uh, to going from our chicken nuggets to our chicken, right? So we can actually end up with something that looks a little bit funny there. If we go ahead and we do now check our small plot research, or in other words, go from our chicken to our nuggets, how is it different? Is it supporting some of these results that we're learning from these farmers or not? And so very briefly here, I want to share with you a research that actually Jeff Edwards started here at OSU. I know David Marburger continued, and I also continued it up in Kansas. And we had our collaborator in Texas do it there as well. So we have a bunch of site years of replicator research where we're testing several varieties against two management practices. It's either a standard management practice with a new goal of close to 70 bushels per acre, no fungicide application, or an intensive management where we're going with an extra 40 units of nitrogen and two shots of fungicide. Right, so if you've been to the Chickasha field day before, these are the plots that are there in Chickasha. And we have three locations in Kansas and, and one in Texas as well. So these plots look like uh, this. So this is a photo from, from Brian Marnau. Our intensive management, they're typically much greener. Uh, and we can see some plots lodging there as well. Our standard management here, there's a lot of variability in color because of losing leaf area, right? A lot of stripe rust, especially 2016, leaf rust 2017, but really losing a lot of leaf area because of these different sensitivities of these different varieties to, to stripe rust in this case here. This is an example of a variety that has a pretty good straw strength and how it's responding to nitrogen here. So you can see many more tillers out there. Uh, and a lot more open space, open, open canopy here. Now, what was the yield gain? So keep in mind, we have here over 4,000 observations of different varieties with on one management versus with the other management. What we're looking at here is just the yield gain, right? The yield gap, the difference between how much, well, how much did we gain by going with that uh, more intensive management? And here's the number of times that we saw each one of those response. So we have some negative response, probably very dry years that didn't pay for us to go with that management. But on average, we're gaining on these 17 years that were, or 17 sites that we're doing this study, on average, 12 bushels per acre of yield gain, ranging from or, or most of the values that we're seeing are gain between 2 and 20 bushels per acre. So, that's just looking across all the varieties, across all the locations as well. What if we start looking at these varieties differently? Varieties that are resistant to stripe rust versus varieties that are susceptible to stripe rust. And this is what we're looking at here. This is the size of the gain that we had from about zero here all the way to close to 70 bushels per acre. Just gain from going from one management to the other. And varieties that are resistant to stripe rust in green Intermediate and susceptible. And this is a probability, right? So 50% means that in half of those years, we got at least six bushels per acre in that resistant variety. But if we look at susceptible varieties, our gain is much bigger, or much larger. 15 bushels per acre on average in those susceptible varieties. That's what we're gaining from going with the more intensive management. And here, just uh, you, you might be familiar with some of these varieties. Uh, I plotted some names there from uh, SY Monument, LCS Chrome, all the way to 4303 Everest scan mark here. So these varieties are ordered in their response range. So you see that from very low responsive varieties to very high response varieties here. So the, the, the gain range from two bushels per acre all the way to over 20 bushels per acre, just for managing those varieties specifically, right? Now, what are the differences? If we look at 1863 or Monument there, uh, monument, pretty good disease package, perhaps not responding to fungicide. Both of them, the straw strength is probably not the best out there, so maybe that extra nitrogen causing some lodging. On the other hand here, we have varieties that uh, have a pretty good straw strength, doesn't have much disease uh, tolerance, and so they're actually gaining quite a bit of yield from going that more intensive management. 
if we look at how much we're gaining based on what's our average yield, right? So if our average yield is 15 through 90 bushels per acre, so this would be the average of all varieties in each one of those trials, it seems like susceptible varieties, again, the higher our yield potential, the higher our yield gain as well. Because that yield potential is typically related to more disease pressure. And finally, I guess a, a question here, does it pay, right? What, what's our probability of break even if we're going with this more intensive management? And as you can see here, if you look at those costs that we're using out there, actually uh, we're, we're putting the costs of pretty expensive fungicides. So actually, uh, if we would go with generic fungicides, our cost for break even would not be 10 bushels per acre. It could be less. But looking at a possible here uh, uh, break-even cost of 10 bushels per acre from going with that intensive management, again, we have close to 50, 60, or close to 60% probability of break-even with a susceptible variety, and it decreases as we have more uh, varieties that are resistant to, to stripe rust. So the one thing that was not considered in that break-even is if we're, if we're getting paid for protein. Is there a market for protein? Right? And so what we're looking at here is that there's typically, typically as we increase yield, we decrease our protein concentration. That's what happened in 2016. But what we can see if we look at all this data and try to make sense of it from these trials that started here in Chicaché, we can see that that intensive management is actually increasing our protein levels. So if there's a chance to get paid for protein, that, that's perhaps where it, it can pay. We played a lot of different economic scenarios here, and really, the only scenario where it paid to really go with this intensive management was a susceptible variety with generic fungicides and getting paid for protein. So it was a very specific scenario where, where it was actually more profitable to go with this uh, very intensive management. Folks, that wraps up uh, my presentation. There are some take-home points here uh, very briefly, but uh, some of the things that were most related to yield, including fuller fungicide, phosphorus, no-till, some previous crop, and lower plant population. And our field research really kind of ground truth in that, that variety specific management, right? Understanding the traits of your variety so we can better manage it. And with that, I'd like to open for any questions, if you guys, whatever you guys might have. Yeah, so about, 56, about 55 percent of them we're using. So I see uh, you're shaking your head, so I don't think that's, that's reflective of... Yeah, well, uh, and, and I can see where... So, so he's amazed that probably it's not more than that. And I can see where you're coming from, because among all pro crops, probably wheat is our most responsive to that in full fertilizer, especially in early, w w in early growth. Sometimes we don't see the, the yield there, but, but I mean, especially that early growth and in acid soil. So for Oklahoma conditions where we're grazing for a lot of the, our acres are grazed, and we have quite a bit of acid soils, it would make a lot of sense to, to put some in starter FOSS. And, well, I can, I can say that for these fields specifically, they have a history of manure, right? So the, it, it has been in their management. That's why they have such a high fertility. Now, if you're going to start for a field that has perhaps low p-values, and, and uh, it's probably more economical to, to go with population than with fertility. I, I didn't put those numbers in, but I would think that that takes a long time to build that very high fertility. Oh, in these fields here, I know that they are using UAN. Yes, that's a good, good question. Now, there was urea as well among these, the, the 100 fields, there were urea as well. Now, this small group here with very low populations, they are using UAN. So the Kansas Wheat Commission took at least the winners, and they have a small sub-data set with the milling and baking. The one thing that I looked at was protein so far. Uh, and one interesting thing that we saw is that on these very high fertility fields, we, tend to, we don't have as much of a steep decrease in our protein as we increase grain yield. So typically, as we increase grain yield at the same nitrogen level, we would have a decrease in protein. Uh, here, we don't see that steep decrease probably because we have different fertility levels there. 
Uh, we are doing some work. Uh, I know that uh, David Marburger was, we were collaborating uh, until last year. So here OSU and K-State, where we're looking at different varieties, different managements, and all the, the million baking spectrum, I mean, characteristics. So we're trying to develop that information, but it takes some time, it takes some time. And there was a small subset using. It, it wasn't really significant, didn't show up in any of the ways that we look at the data. Uh, so some of them were using Palisade at that jointing stage. Um, so in this data, it didn't really show up much. When we look at research plots that, that Jeff Edwards conducted here when I was here and, and some of the research that we're doing now as well, we see very, uh, the, the results there are not very consistent. So for example, if, if you hit the exact right timing, you might get a two or three inch reduction in, in your height and perhaps even in, in your lodging as well. If you miss that timing, you might see really nothing. I have several of the trials that we really didn't see much of, of height reduction. You spray, and then it's followed by a 40-day drought. I mean, it's going to be boot height. It's going to be really, really short. And it's on the label for you not, I mean, if it's dry conditions not to do that, then we kind of confirm that. So it, it's been, uh, you need just the right timing, and you can get a two, three-inch reduction. Now, if the concern is lodging, I'm, I assume the concern is lodging for this question, some of the data that we're collecting really steer us towards variety. You know, we, we have such a broad range of varieties to choose from. Some of them have better uh, straw strength. Some of them uh, are naturally more prone to lodging. So if pushing, I would definitely recommend starting with, with a variety that has a pretty good straw strength, rather than rely on Palisade alone. Mm -hmm.